नमस्कार लर्नर्स एंड व्यूवर्स ऑफ पी जी डिप्लोमा इन सस्टेनेबिलिटी साइंस लेट मी इंट्रोड्यूस माई सेल्फ वेरी ब्रीफली आई एम नंदिनी सिन्हा कपूर अ प्रोफेसर विद द स्कूल ऑफ interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary studies at Indira Gandhi National Open University welcome you to this session on ecological balance and indian ethos let us begin with a very brief introduction environmental pollution may be traced back to the evolution of homo sapiens what you understand by homo sapiens that is today you and i stand erect that is from the evolution point of view of man Homo sapiens on earth and it was realized 2500 years ago during the time of ancient Greek philosopher Plato in the process of metamorphosis that is transformation of primitive man into a civilized man environment was neglected importance was given to science and technology resulting in environmental pollution when human being was roaming in the forests he knew neither good nor bad human being without any knowledge of shelter cooking speech and industry he did not need his fellow creatures nor he had any desire to hurt them thus when man was uncivilized and unpolluted it was said that nothing was more pure than the state of nature and nothing was more polluted than man in the state of nature now let us come to environmental jurisprudence ancient and medieval period Uh, with reference to to the world religions as such as well as to uh, india in particular now what you understand by jurisprudence that is in general the laws related to the protection of environmental uh, resources natural resources india being a secular country a good environmental sense has been one of our fundamental features of indian philosophy The civilization of India has grown up in close association with nature. To preserve and protect nature, human being must take sincere efforts. Ecological imbalances and environmental destructions are good examples to say that human beings failed in his duty voluntarily than compulsory action. Therefore, a compulsory action must be taken over to protect it. it is this process of human negligence and carelessness dealing with environment which gave birth to environmental jurisprudence that is there was a sense to protect and to bring laws ethos in we are talking today not of the laws in particular but of the ethics and ethos to protect and conserve natural environment India has been rich not only economically but also intellectually the scientific knowledge which now discovered is not new for india as far as pollution is concerned since development and degradation progress and pollution economics and environment they all go together development cannot be stopped as it is a natural instinct of man the examples are the air that a man respires and emits the odor he emits etc industry is the other cause of pollution and if industry is necessary evil then pollution is the surest after effect of it the pollution is unsolved problem which has been termed as a slow poison and is as old as the human civilization itself The instinct of protection of environment is inherent among the Indians which motivated the Indians to lay down certain religious precepts and rules and to take corresponding measures in an attempt to protect the environment as i said today's talk is with reference to world religion and uh, what kind of environmental protection and ethics are laid down in these religious precepts Now let us look at the historical analysis of Indian law. Now I will bring you back to take you back to ancient Indian history. The significance of environment and environmental protection are not new to India. It is it can now be traced back this protection laws to 300 BC. The principles of environmental protection are found in Arthashastra written by Kautilya the prime minister in the court of Chandragupta Maurya and as we know that Mauryan empire is the first South, South Asian empire. The prime minister of the Magadhan dynasty during the period of Chandragupta Maurya Arthashastra deals with environmental protection and lays down various rules in all angles minutely with great detail. For instance, Arthashastra provides rules to protect 
preserve and improve the forest and animal species, that is protection of wildlife. Killing of animals and birds, cutting trees were forbidden and if any harm is caused or pollution is caused in the city, then penalty was prescribed during the Mauryan period. Even if the wild animals from forest are seen where people live, they sh should not be killed or no injury should be inflicted upon them, they can be driven out. During the period of Ashok the great Mauryan emperor, the fifth pillar edict, one of his inscriptions, because he's famous for uh, laying down the inscriptions throughout the uh, great major trade routes and routes of communication. Now the fifth pillar edict lays down that killing different species of animals and birds which are harmless, which are of utility and should not be eaten, right? So there is a uh, complete uh, ban on the killing of different animals and birds which were harmless, just for the sake of their meat. During the fast days, the days that you keep fast and full moon days, Puran Masi, deforestation must be prohibited. The forests maintain ecological balance and they are a reserve of food to sustain cultivation. Uh, it, it sustains cultivation in the hilly areas and the products of medicinal plants also have to be protected and therefore forests have to be conserved. Now, from Mauryan period, I will take you to medieval period of Indian history and our uh, venue of this, the, the, the drama is being staged in Western Rajasthan, particularly the desert areas of Bikaner and Jodhpur in particular. Tuesday, September 9th, I will now introduce the Bishnois. I hope some of you are familiar with the Bishnoi sect of India. Bishnois are a living culture in Haryana and Rajasthan, of course. Bishnois are one of the earliest people in India, in historic India, who are, it's a grassroots people's movement responsible for environmental conservation and preservation. Now let us look at this famous event. September 9th, Tuesday in the year 1730, and we are talking about 18th century, Khejarli, a small village near Jodhpur. Soldiers of Maharaja Abhay Singh, the ruler of Jodhpur, arrived there and started cutting the Khejri trees. By the way, Khejri trees are known as the lifelines of a desert economy and therefore society. Now, these trees had to be used as firewood for a royal construction project. Amrita Devi, a Bishnoi woman in this village, quickly noticed and rushed to stop the soldiers. The soldiers rejected her request and continued their plunder. The news spread like a wildfire in the surrounding areas, and as many as 300, and, so it is documented, as in the historical documents, that as many as 363 Bishnois clung to the trees and were killed one by one by the royal uh, army. And before the news reached the king, and once the king came to know, he stopped his soldiers in, uh, from killing uh, the Bishnoi villagers. The question naturally arises, who were these Bishnois, the tree huggers, and what motivated them to sacrifice their lives to protect the Khejri trees, the lifeline of economy? Bishnois were a socio-religious reform movement in the heart of uh, Third Desert, Western Rajasthan, where uh, their guru, Jamboji, propounded a philosophy in which the local flora and fauna, both the trees, vegetation, and wildlife had to be protected. This in view of the fact that the resources of any desert, society and economy, are very scarce, and they could not be destroyed in order to, to fulfill short-term needs and they had to be preserved for the desert society to flourish and the local state formation processes were going on. Uh, without resources being preserved, the local states of Bikhani, Jodhpur and Jaisalmer could not be sustained and therefore we have uh, charters being given by the local royal families of these states, particularly Jodhpur, to Bishnoi villages, uh, protecting it from any intruder who would have cut the trees or killed the local animals. One is struck by a huge number of deers freely 
uh, you know, uh, running in the uh, uh, freely roaming in the Bishnoi villages, and the notice is placed by the Department of Forest of Government of Rajasthan. One of the famous sanctuaries for the black bucks and one of the animals traditionally protected by the Bishnois are to be found in the Bishnoi areas. You may remember there was a famous case against the Bollywood actor Salman Khan and his team who had come for shooting of a movie and they had killed the black bucks and it is the Bishnois who brought this case to the police and the case was registered. Even as the biodiversity is increasingly endangered in other parts of India and the world, the biodiversity of the desert state of Rajasthan is managed not only by human isolation, but by active human participation, Vishnu is being one of the prime examples of it. In addition to the black bucks, other animals and birds that are found in and around Vishnu villages are great Indian bustards, Indian gazelles, peacocks, bulbuls, buyers, sparrows, crows, vultures, chinkara, nil guys, wild pigs, wolves, jackals, and desert foxes. And the trees that are commonly found in the Vishnoi villages are khejri, jal, people, khair, rohira, babul, and neem, and all have medicinal values. So the strong emphasis of Guru Jamboji and his followers is on revering the animals and trees, and it also resembles the Hindu practices. It is an offshoot of the Hindu community only, and Jain emphasis on nonviolence. Uh, viewers and uh, learners have a look at the Vishnoi villages, uh, uh, very colorful photographs of Vishnoi villages. You can see a Vishnoi man with his uh, flock of uh, uh, flock of animals, then nice paintings, you know, on the Vishnoi huts. Uh, there is a Vishnoi woman who is uh, doing the, you know, the chakki. And as, as I said just now, that the deers roam freely in the Vishnoi villages. You can see uh, the, the Vishnoi villages for yourselves. Here is the founder. Here is the two photographs of Guru Jamboji. Uh, he was born in mid 15th century in Nokha in uh, district Bikani today. He is Guru Jamboji, the founder of the Vishnoi sect. Now, from there, we'll come down quickly to the 18th century. The great emperor Chhatrapati Shivaji also ordered not to injure animals and plants. Plantations were made by the roadsides to help the travelers to have rest. He commanded the people to protect forests and preserve the water resources without polluting. Despite of all ancient wisdom, the development of science and technology have continued to damage and ecological balance has been disturbed. The Indian environmental jurisprudence has relied on three interconnected elements. Firstly, it manifests the new Indian constitutional law, rational, which clearly accords importance to public concerns rather than the private concern for protecting the nature. Secondly, it reflects certain aspects of Indian legal culture through implicit and explicit reliance on autochinous. What is autochinous? That is indigenous, tribals. Autochinous values based on ancient pre-colonial indigenous notions and concepts of law. Thirdly, it bears testimony to the uniquely activist role of the higher Indian judiciary in promoting this new rationale of protecting and conserving the nature. These three elements characterize the manner and approach adopted in the recent development of Indian environmental jurisprudence. The Indian environmental jurisprudence proceeds closely in line with legal ideologies towards creating a human right for a clean environment which has been frequently voiced in the international forum. Now let us look at the spiritual and religious traditions of India. The religion and culture awakes at the human being and make him realize that human life is not just about material possession, but it is beyond the consumption. Spiritual traditions recognize divinity in nature and worship nature. Each religion has injunction that can form a code for environmentally sustainable development. Hinduism is one of the ancient religions on earth and both the texts, the Vedas declare water to be all the Vedas, you know, the, our ancient most texts, they declare water to be the original being of reality and fire is considered as a life principle in Rig Veda and defines the immortal light in mortals. According to Hindu religion, God and nature are not different aspects, they are one and the same. And we continue to worship plants like Tulsi, people and birds like Garur and animals like lions are worshipped. 
In Hinduism, environmental ethics are part of religious philosophy right since the Vedic period. In Rig Ved, the basic elements of earth, air, water, fire and space, the Panchabhutas, the five basic elements provide the basis for life. According to Indian spiritual tradition, nature does not need to be controlled or transformed or decorated. She needs to be accepted as she is. Vedas considered the five elements to be gods. What were the five elements? Earth, air, water, fire, and space, right? And they were the product of the cosmology or the antariksh. Water is the source of all living being and strength of earth or cause of the earth. And this is being echoed in Chandagya Upanishad where Varun Devta is the god of water. Air is the source of energy, he is, uh, is the Bayu Devata, fire is Agni Devata, deriving its energy from the Surya Deva. The forests are rich source of natural energy and act as balancers of ecology and are held by Vana Devata. For example, now look, let us look at the, the symbols of our goddesses like Lakshmi is the lotus flower. Banyan tree is attributed to Brahman, people is attributed to Vishnu, fig is attributed to Rudra, tree is Vriksha Devata. So Devata, so they are all gods. In the nature, we always worship it as gods. Said Vriksha Rakshati Rakshita. Bara and Matsa Purans regarded planting of trees as auspicious activities. Atharva Veda speaks about protection of wildlife and domestic cattle. The ancient scriptures, Chandagya Upanishad, for instance, has explained the interrelationship and correlation between the human beings and environment. The earth is the essence of nature and water is the essence of earth. Vegetation is the essence of water. Human life is the essence of vegetation and meditation is the essence of human life. In other Veda, it is chanted that whatever I dig out from the earth, it should quickly, there is replenishment, it should quickly grow over. Oh God, let me not injure the vital heart. The principle is similar to the right to life with environmental sustainability. Thus, principle of sustainable development is not evolved recently, but it's an ancient since the Vedic times. Rig, Yajur and Samavedas are highlighting importance of Yagna. In Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna says to Arjuna that I am the essence of water, the brightness and light of sun and moon. Lord says that I am the universe and nature, I am the purifier, I am the sun and rain, I am the life and death, I am the origin and existence and also said I am the people tree among other trees. Smriti is like Manusmriti and Yagavalka also stress on the importance of environmental protection. Manu Smriti mentions about the optimum use of natural resources that is one of principles of sustainable development. Now let's come to Buddhism. Buddhism respects norms of ecology. They are forbidden to cut trees, destroy animals, birds, and pollute water. And I should remind you that modern Emperor Ashok was heavily influenced by the principles of Buddhism. Universal compassion, non-violence, love and service, and mutual protection, protection are all basics and attributes of Buddhism. Jainism. Jainism, as you know, is very famous for its non-violent ethics. Jain scriptures preach not to injure, abuse, or oppress, enslave, insult, torment, torture, or kill any creature for or any living being for that matter. Ahimsa is the Jain way of life, and for them, environmental harmony through spirituality may be attained by adhering to three precepts, right belief, right conduct, and right knowledge. Lord Mahabira says that nothing is so subtler and smaller than an atom, and so vast uh, than space, and no quality is more subtle than the quality of non-violence. Sikhism. In the, for the Sikhs also, divinity lies in the nature and to meet their needs without over-exploiting the nature. Jorastrianism. This is one of the oldest religions of art founded by Jorastru. Jorastrians are more conscious of nature, not only in their words, but also in their thoughts and deeds. They have reverence towards nature gifts such as air, water, earth, fire, animals, plants, and related matter. Christianity, biblical verses in Old and New Testaments provide that it is the duty of man to protect nature and humanity, must safeguard or care for the environment. Christianity prescribes a harmonious relationship between man and nature. Islam, Holy Quran's message is equally the same. 
Message is unity, harmony, balance and order representing the sustainable development. One should not alter the environment or disrupt the balance. If any such damage is caused to environment, it is considered a mischief. God is the owner and man is the guardian of all creatures. Allah has created nature and thus destruction of nature is injurious to Allah. Destruction of Allah are said to be oppressing themselves. Islam says that man is the replica of universe and it is the duty of every man to safeguard the health of universe. Judaism. Jews are more concerned for the environment. The foundation for Judaism is safeguarding the living creatures. Jews regard humanity as custodian of the world and warn them not to destroy the world. If done, there will be no one to set it right. The fundamental Jewish principle is to preserve, protect and safeguard the environment. So especially now we see the Hindus have much faith in their spiritual and cultural traditions and principles and examples we have already quoted from the Bishnois. Now coming to Chipko movement, Bishnoi movement was the historic example which gave inspiration for the Chipko movement in the Himalayas in the 1973. And as you know, the, it all began with its founder, Sundarlal Bahuguna, who was awarded Padma Bhushan. The villagers of Uttar Pradesh formed a human chain in the Himalayas and protested against the cutting of trees. The same event of protest was followed by villagers near Himalayas in 1974, forcing contractors not to fell trees. Since then, the Chipko movement has developed into an eco-development movement. Gandhian perspective, Mahatma Gandhi says that environment is a repository of human spirit. He thought of the consequences of industrialization and urbanization. He tried to reestablish the Indian culture and ancient tradition, but due to mesmerism of science and technology, no one cared about it. He initiated Swadeshi movement. He believed that India's backbone lies in his villages, and perishing it would mean that perishing the very essence of India's uh, backbone, essentials of India. Gandhi's remarkable foresight and ability to go to the root cause of ecological problems told that the need of the poorest should receive the topmost priority in the development planning. Gandhi stated quite clearly that the greed of a few people and their tendency to pursue a highly affluent and wasteful lifestyle could prove very destructive to nature. His solution to the environmental crisis is clearly is to curb this greed. Therefore, he said, our earth has enough for everyone's need, but it doesn't have for everyone's greed. The UNO, the UN organization also felt the need to have coordination between development and protection of environment, leading to legislative arch. The development leads to the industrialization, urbanization, which in turn, as we know, leads to pollution and environmental degradation. Modern period, we'll quickly sum it up, environment is an all-encompassing term, and there has never been a more appropriate time to consider environmental law than now. Globalization and technological innovations have changed the industrial composition, typically from resource and agricultural-based industries to heavy industries, high-tech manufacturing, etc., which has precipitated a massive environmental change. Nature is always tolerant and productive, but the heavy disturbances caused in the ecosystem, unlimited extraction of, extraction of natural products made nature intolerable and started showing consequences of such activities. What is an environmental ethics? Environmental ethics employs concepts from entire field of philosophy, especially aesthetics, metaphysics, epistemology, philosophy of science and social and political philosophy. Environmental ethics is the discipline that studies the moral relationship of human beings and also the value and moral status of environment and its non-human contents cover. The challenge of environmental ethics to anthro Post-centricism, that is human centeredness, embedded, it is embedded in the traditional Western ethical thinking, and this anthropocentricism, human centricism, is destructive to the natural resources. The early development of the environmental ethics as a discipline, it all had to uh, do with connection of deep ecology, environmental ethics, and social ecology. The attempt to apply traditional ethical theories, including consequentialism, deontology, and virtue 
ethics to support contemporary environmental concerns and the focus of environmental literature on wilderness and possible future developments of this discipline called environmental ethics. The approaches of man towards environmental ethics are of two kinds. One is ecocentric approach that we protect the natural environment. Other is the anthropocentric or homocentric, man-centric. So ecocentric approach is considered to be a broad approach where the environmental quality covers the entire ecosphere. In this approach, nature has to be viewed and respected in a unified version. Therefore, ecocentric ethics has concern for the entire ecosystem. So we have almost completed our uh, session on environmental ethos and uh, the ethics that India and world religions have showed towards conservation of uh, natural uh, resources. So in conclusion, I would like to say the following uh, uh, few sentences that in conclusion, we can mention that drought, changing weather patterns, expected burden of caring for environmental refugees, effects of consumerism, and the health decline associated with various forms of pollution are continuing, they continue to grow. And major problems for human beings themselves continue to grow and raise crucial issues about environmental justice. I hope this is clear for you. So at the same time, continuing destruction of natural environments and the widespread loss of both plant and animal species pose increasing problems for other forms of life on the planet. I repeat that continuing destruction of natural environments and the widespread loss of both plant and animal species pose increasing problems for other forms of life on the planet. Thank you so much, viewers and learners of PG Diploma in Sustainability Science. I hope I have made myself intelligible to, to all of you uh, while discussing the environmental ethics in India, Indian society and Indian history and how we have continued with social and civil movements to protect the natural environment as well as I have also mentioned very briefly that how international uh, bodies like UNO has also intervened. With that, uh, with that, we now come to an end of this session. Thank you so much and Namaskar.